Venga. show up. She canceled at five o'clock. Another intellectual slob. <laughs> and then, when my grandpa got off the boat at Ellis Island, he was sure the streets of America were paved with gold. In later years, he told me in perfect English, he said, son, I found the gold not in the streets, but in our English language. I knew to be a participating, full-fledged citizen, I had to learn English. I thank God for America, her people, and the gold-encrusted language we call our own. Now, Grandpa, some Americans don't want to speak English. The selling of another language, my friends, in this country, next on the Morton Downey Jr. Show. <laughs> Let's, exam let's examine this topic a little bit more closely than we do some of them, okay? We've got some real experts in the studio tonight. We'll find out. I think probably our audience is as expert as any of the so-called experts we've got. On our home base, we've got uh, George uh, Trevino, League of Latin American Citizens. Good evening, George. I assume Joseph. you're George. Joseph, he's George. <laughs> you're, you're Joseph, right. he's George. That's in English, too. Jose, yeah. como esta? Muy bien, gracias. Usted? Yeah. Bueno, gracias. Yeah. Huh? Me da gusto. We're into another damn language already, huh? <laughs> Hell, this ought, to be, this ought to be big in Miami tonight. <laughs> George, George Trippiatis, all right? George Trippiatis is with us. English first. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. How are you? Good. Well, let me just go with some questions for Mr. Trifiatis. You call your group English first. Aren't we first already? We're first, but only de facto. We want to make it de jour. We want to make English the official language of the land, official language of the government. Through it's a never been made the official language of the land? Never been in law, never been in part of the Constitution. How come? There, I don't think there was necessarily a need for it in the past. Nowadays, well, at one time early in our history, wasn't German going to be the official language? Well, there was a debate over that. And uh -huh. I, think, I think we overcame that debate, and people figured that the, the issue was settled. But now I think in these recent years, the issues come back again, and uh, different languages are now the focus of, of the debate. Mr. Trevino, we've heard from Mr. Trifadis. What do you see as the motivation for the English First Movement? Well, there's money in them hills. Um, English first is somewhat of a Johnny-come-lately to uh, the effort to uh, declare English through a constitutional amendment to the national constitution, uh, the official language of the United States. Some states uh, for many years had had in their constitution uh, declarations, resolutions that uh, stated that English was the official language of that particular state. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I must add that, uh, that somewhat as a Johnny-come-lately, uh, English first is... Um, uh, a project, if it hasn't changed, of uh, the Committee to Protect the Family, which in, of its, in and of itself is a program of the Christian Broadcast Network, uh, which There's certainly... Is wrong with that, perhaps? That, no, That's not no, true. no, no, I mean... That's uh, not true. It, it was, has nothing to do it, with it. It was true the last time we debated a couple no, of months ago. It was not true then either. But, you know, had nothing be, to be, do with it. Be that as it may... It's a lie. Uh, be, be, that, be that as it may, uh, you know, there, there, there is a lot of, uh, of money in terms of solicitations over the mail, and uh, clearly some of the solic solicitations that English First has sent out under the signature of Larry Pratt, um, I have them here if you wanted to look at them. You know, basically our efforts well, to... There's a lot of money in what you're doing, too, though. You can't tell me that LULAC isn't founded by uh, people who send money What's the name of your organization, LULAC? It's, uh, it's wrong up there. It's the League LULAC? of United. Yeah, it's the... <laughs> It's uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens, and uh, 
um, it's, it's the oldest and largest Hispanic membership organization in the country. It's a volunteer group. It's a not-for-profit group. And uh, they basically, uh, you know, we raise money to give scholarships to kids. Uh, scholarships for what? College and things? For college, sure. I mean, you know, there are a lot of kids who want to go to college. We provide uh, educational service centers to, on a walk-in basis. very admirable. Uh, do you send them to college? Uh, do they know English when they go to college? Well, I mean, presumably one goes to college, you know, one does, you know, can master the English language, you know. I, I think at least we can presume that. We could well, have why them. can we presume it if they've gotten that far and they haven't mastered it yet? Well, no, what I'm saying is are that... Are we saying that high school graduates are stupid and only if you go to college can you master the English language? No, all I'm saying is that uh, if that, uh, you're a young person in the United States and you find it difficult uh, to put together the resources to be able to pay tuition, that LULAC, among many other groups in the United States, uh, are there to provide help. That's, that's very admirable. I'd like to add that LULAC, when it was uh, founded in 1929, had in its constitution that the official language of that organization would be English. So I think that uh, now they're advocating uh, policies which contradict that. Well, really, that what are you advocating? Oh, we haven't really identified that. That's, that's not fair to what, uh, Joseph. Uh, what we advocate, basically, is, uh, is pluralism. I'm a fair guy. Sure. I've heard. Um, uh, what we're advocating, basically, is, uh, is uh, pluralism and tolerance, which I think are the principles on which this country was based uh, and continues to be based. Uh, we don't take uh, the position that uh, English should be... Uh, it should be English only. We believe in the concept of English Plus. We think that uh, it's in the interest of our country, both for our international endeavors, diplomatic, economic, etc., that uh, kids not only become proficient in English, because we believe that's important in order to succeed in the United States, uh, yeah. and many people who come to the United States do become proficient in English, as I have. Oh, I attempted it too. Um, but th the idea is that uh, we should have English Plus, and we shouldn't limit ourselves to just one English. Clearly, we need to have programs, we need to have an educational In other system. Words, wait, wait a second, let me see if I can cut to the bull here a second. Sure. Are you saying that we should have English plus, meaning English is our first language, and plus let them learn other languages? Correct. Well, you don't have anything that you find wrong with that, no. do you? That's, that's why we're called English first. We, yeah. we feel that yeah, English well, is the primary language. English first language. also. Right. The point, though, that... He's saying English first well, also. But as I, as I as said earlier, is that we're English only, that we want to force people to stop speaking English, no, to, or that. to stop speaking foreign languages, I didn't that say sort that. of thing. That's, that's been the, the common no, charge. I really didn't hear him say that. You I guys hear him say that? that? Yeah. I didn't hear him say that. I, I hear a guy, I hear you're English first, all right? And I'm with you 100%, all right? Yeah. I say English first, too. Sure. But I say that maybe we ought to start challenging the brains of our high school kids in this country sure. and let them learn another damn language. That's and if they already right. know Spanish or French or German or whatever it is, then immerse them and make them learn English, yeah. all right? Well, we've got, make two, them learn we've English. got two issues here. One is whether the non-English speaking child is going, to be speak, is going to learn to speak English and whether the English speaking child is going to learn a foreign language. That's, in that second case, we figure, you know, we say, go ahead, learn that second language. I myself speak. Oh, yeah, I, think, speak I, think, you, I think you should. The, I the mean, all the European is, countries, all the South American countries, they're all teaching the problem their is children that, a second the language. The kids are learning is, only one language. Is English first it racist? No, it's not. It's, it's not, not racist, racist at all. Okay. We don't, uh, we don't sig single out any group as, uh, as some kind of a nasty group. We don't say that English is a morally superior language. We say, again, it's, English is the first language you need to learn in order to get ahead in this country, and it's important to do that. How about it, uh, Joe? Is uh, English first racist? Well, you know, I, I think it would be unfair for me and certainly uh, even possibly wrong for me to, to allege or suggest that any one individual or group of individuals, because they choose to come together on a particular issue, are racist in and of themselves. Uh, I think that, that that's unfair. Um, I wouldn't say that. I do say that oftentimes movements such as the English First, for example, which is the subject of the discussion tonight, uh, oftentimes uh, serve as an opportunity as a vehicle for people who want to express racist tendencies. Why? Well, I mean, uh, for example... Why? What's uh, racist about wanting to speak English? No, no, no. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't say that there was anything racist about you wanting to speak English. You mean some of the wrong people get yeah, on, that, that's on, right. on board think, the vehicle? I think, I think we all suffer from that as organizations. Oh, hell, you probably got some of the wrong people get um, on top of your vehicle. Like I said, we all suffer from some of that. Yeah. And I'm sure that that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that poses a, a problem for, for all groups in the United States. All right. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to suggest, nor have I ever attempted to suggest, uh, that, uh, that English first or English only or U.S. English or... You know, any, any given group is Okay, is let's a take a break for a minute. So far, I haven't learned diddly squat. This is very boring. <laughs> next, we'll, next, we'll look at some of the selfish reasons which motivate people to support bilingualism in this country. Coming up next, stand by.
guests for the Morton Downey Jr. show stay at the Meadowlands Hilton. I'm, not, I'm, tr I'm trying not to get too close to you fellas because I got a bad case of the flu tonight and I, I don't want to make one of you guys sick. Although I'm hopeful by the end of the show we'll find out that one of you is. Uh, how about it, uh, gentlemen, uh, for Mr. Trevino? The whole issue of ballots being made available in various national tongues. Would you consider the prospect of English-only election ballots a threat to the Hispanic political power base in this country? Well, as you know, uh, the, the privilege of, of exercising the right to vote in the United States is, is certainly fundamental um, for, uh, for many for years. Citizens. For, for citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for many years, uh, black Americans were disenfranchised, and as you know, there were many vehicles that were imposed to prevent them from voting, where the poll tax, the poll literacy tax, tax etc. Um, and well, you think a literacy test? I, I think a literacy test as well served as an obstacle, and certainly the Congress has examined that issue and has concluded that uh, uh, with respect to... Uh, uh, people who are considered language minorities or members of language minorities in the United States, such as uh, Alaskan Natives, such as American Indians, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans as well, uh, language uh, has been used as a barrier for the exercise of, uh, of the vote. So I do believe that uh, limiting voting uh, to, uh, to English uh, only, if you will, uh, ballots, I think that it does impose uh, certainly a barrier to people who, want to, who are American citizens, whether native or naturalized, who want to exercise the right of the, of the vote. Well, you know, let's, let's try and go back a little bit and uh, try and remember to become an American citizen. Mm -hmm. You have to go down, you have to be able to answer some sure. questions, not in Spanish, not in German, not in anything else, and in English. Yeah, it, it, Meaning, you know, you, yeah, you no, have no, a no, common no, understanding no. of the English we're, language. We're, we're on the right track, but yeah. I, think, I think that... Uh, that so uh, why in the it, hell should we spend taxpayers' bucks like they do in California? Yeah. To and 26 different language ballots in California alone. There, there's, no, there's no doubt, and I wouldn't argue against your point. I mean, clearly the expense is a valid criticism. What I'm saying, though, is that we need to be realistic. The English, the, the familiarity and proficiency in English that one demonstrates in the naturalization process is far different than the proficiency in English that one has to demonstrate, for example, in California. I mean, some of that stuff is not even in plain English. So that a person such as myself and possibly some of the members of your audience would even have a difficulty in understanding now my something. Audience. <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not familiar. Uh, I'm not. I'm not familiar with uh, uh, with the the language, if you will, the the terms, the bureaucraties that some ballots are written with, some initiatives and propositions. But I will tell you that in the five years that I lived in California, um, I oftentimes had a difficulty understanding what the hell the initiative was all about. And so, if it's difficult enough for me, who uh, attempts to be proficient in English, um, I think it oftentimes poses an obstacle for the people who may not be as proficient in English as we would like for them to be. Well, yeah. let, me, let me follow that a little bit further then, this, this line of thought here. Uh, isn't the insistence upon ballots in Spanish mm -hmm. somewhat self-serving, uh, let's say to you? In other words, if these people learned English and could read a ballot in English, wouldn't you lose your constituency? What the hell they need you for? I'm not running for office. Uh, I don't, I mean... What's your job? What's your job, though? Uh, my, my job is, is basically to, uh, uh, to represent uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens in, in Washington and throughout the United States and to be able to promote the, the policies that the organization stands League for. League of, of the, Latin American... League of United Latin American United Citizens. United Latin American One Citizens. Of the things that, that, it doesn't say in there United States citizens anyway. No. So you don't care if the United States is, that's not your... No, well, to, to the contrary. Uh, early on, uh, when the organization was uh, in its formative stages in 1921 through 1927 uh, in South Texas, one of the requirements written into the Constitution, which was changed until recently, was that to be a member of the organization, you had to be a citizen. Uh, that, Why that has was, it changed? That was a good changed, audience from the question. That was the changed class. because uh, the organization is a volunteer organization, ma'am. And uh, what we strive to do, basically, is to invite people from the community as volunteers to work in service to that community. And oftentimes that when you limit people to being citizens, it means that oftentimes you have people who are well-meaning and are willing to devote some of their time who are not American citizens, either naturalized or native, that are legal residents from participating in the organization. It's right, it's an, a, somewhat of a self-serving uh, change on our part to say, look, 
If you're a legal resident in the United States and you want to work in service to your community, join us. We can work with you. That's it. I mean, but you definitely, you definitely get with your citizens and you, with your members, and you say, look, we want you to learn the English language. I'll go further than that. In the 1940s and through the 1950s, LULAC as an organization sponsored a program, all volunteer, volunteer tutors, volunteer teachers and counselors, a program called the Little Schoolhouse of 400. We taught, I, we, I speak uh, on behalf of the organization, taught people who were not proficient in English, who wanted to become proficient in English, 400 basic words and phrases in English that would help them be able to contribute to the society that they lived in. Like what? Your taxi fare is? Well, uh, your, well, yeah, okay, I mean, sure, you, you could get to that, but I mean, in South Texas, there aren't many taxis, and if you get into one, it's going to cost you a lot of bucks. Uh, you know, basically things, you know, you say thank you, you say, you say hello, you say the time of day, you say, you know, greetings, uh, things that one would normally expect one to use in communicating with other people in the community. How about this? Do you see the issue, the ballots issue we've been talking about as analogous uh, to the literacy test for blacks uh, in the early 1960s? Well, I, I, would, I would go further than that, and I'd say that I would equate uh, the, the elimination of, uh, of ballots and languages other than English as uh, certainly as, uh, as an impediment to, to American citizens who want to exercise the right of the vote. Uh, and we can, uh, we've talked about the poll tax, we've talked about uh, the literacy test, we've talked about uh, a whole range well, of different... Opposed, <clears throat> I'm opposed to the poll tax. I couldn't agree with you more. <clears throat> literacy, I think that's a different story. Well, we've okay. got 26 million illiterate Americans in this country. And that's tragic. Functionally illiterate and that, Americans. And, and right? I agree with you, it's tragic. And it is tragic, and where are most of them coming from? That's most of them are coming from... Most of them, unfortunately, are coming from minority groups that we have an economic bondage in this country because there are groups around this country who don't want them to learn to speak English because then they can use them and abuse them the same way that Jimmy Baker abused his people. That's what's happening. If you want to say something. Providing these services in foreign languages, I think, is discriminatory because it's not provided to every single language group. It's provided only if the, but if the language, language group, group really wants it can claim to the population. language group. There's any 126 of them in California. Enough people Santa in your Rosa, language group. one vote, one right. ballot in Santa Rosa in the last election to a Vietnamese, all right, who knew how to speak the language, all right, because they assimilate into the language beautifully, the Orientals do. Right. One ballot costs $1,500 to the taxpayers mm -hmm. to print and transport that ballot. Now, uh, that is a hell of a poll tax sure on the is. American people's but pocket. The pe and the people who aren't getting that service are saying, why do I have to learn English when these other people don't? And I'm spending my tax dollars to get, to get a ballot that's not in my, in my native language. So you're discriminating against them as well. I'm saying, provided in English, everybody has the equal opportunity. No one's stopping you from learning I'm English. I'm hoping the audience is going to make this more exciting because so far, so far, it sounds kind of, kind of sketchy to me. We'll examine bilingualism from the voting booth to the classroom next on the Morton Downey Jr. Show. got some other folks who are going to join us in this segment. Right now, we're going to continue with our two guests on, the, uh, on home base here. Mr. Trevino, and uh, let me ask you this question. What is bilingual education, and is it working? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, biling uh, well, biling bilingual education takes a... Uh, I guess bilingual edu education takes several forms, or actually two forms. One, I guess, Try would be... And focus in on this sure, One would be, uh, I think, uh, informal, which, uh, you know, one can learn at home, in a sense, as they exchange with their parents, grandparents, their extended family. The other is a formal structure that is, that is, uh, that is applied or, or used uh, by some school districts around the United States uh, to enable kids, uh, typically at the elementary uh, school level, to, uh, to become more proficient uh, than they already are in, uh, in English. And oftentimes those programs are either immersion, which means somewhat sink or swim, uh, which is what I went through in the early 1960s, uh, before there was formalized government sponsored Speak by pretty English. good English. Thank you. Seemed to work uh, pretty well for you. The, the other is uh, transitional programs, uh, which allow a kid to, to learn English as they go, but at the same time uh, not lose any of the educational opportunities. To maintain their native language. To maintain their native language. You have your chance. Culture. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, when you say transitional, when you, when you say transitional, when you say transitional, how long a time are you talking about? Well, you know, that's, that, that oftentimes is a, is a big area of, of uh, heated debate because oftentimes transitional uh, goes uh, three, four, five, six, seven years. Uh, transitional, three, four, five, six, seven yeah, years? Yeah, it, 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 it depends in part on, on, the, on the child's ability to be able to master the English language and at the same time not lose you know, knowledge about other subjects, well, geography, math, Let me, let me math, ask you a question then, and, here's, uh, and this is U.S. Census Bureau figures, all sure. right? It takes the average Oriental family, when they come to this country, three years for their children to assimilate the language and move in. Are you trying to tell me that the Hispanics are not as capable as the Orientals and that's why it can take five, six, seven years for them? No, uh, I think uh, that, that was a general statement. I mean, uh, for the most part, the census, which you, you have cited, also suggests that, uh, that three out of four kids in second generation uh, are either bilingual, Spanish and English, or monolingual, only English. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we're talking about a generational transition, if you will, uh, from, you know, one generation to another where kids acquire proficiency in English and be able to maintain that. Is this working, George? I don't, I don't think it is. I think the emphasis is, all, all the funding is available, the vast majority of funding is available only for the transitional type of uh, bilingual education from the federal government. I think more funds should be available for those alternative methods. If a local school wants an alternative method, that should be available. If, you want, if it wants to use immersion, it ought to be able to, and it can't get the funds nowadays for that. Here's, here's an interesting figure for you. 34%, 1984 and 85, 34% of Hispanic students in the United States, between the ages of 14 and 34, dropped out of school. Yeah. Tough. It really is tough. How the hell are they ever going to assimilate into I our don't society? Know. It's a it's it's a it's a tragic problem, and I'm sure that that uh, that it's a serious for uh, uh, for black kids, uh, for um, uh, for some white kids in some parts of the United States. I mean, it's uh, we're actually in a, in a real difficult situation as a country. Uh, we've got uh, almost a generation that is lost. Why 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 is this happening? I mean, when you look at Hispanic children, frankly, and this isn't an indictment of Hispanic children, I think it's an indictment of our system for not kicking them in the ass, making them get out there and learn the language. Hispanic children perform well below the national average, all right, and well below Asian American students who receive less bilingual education. You know, well, we've, uh, we've attempted to, uh, to survey that, and uh, several groups, including the Congress and, and many others who are certainly more expert in, uh, in trying to figure this problem out, uh, you know, obviously there are other factors that need to be considered. You know, teen pregnancy is a very serious problem. Substance abuse, whether it be alcohol or other drugs, is so a real serious problem. you're saying this is endemic to the Hispanic, uh, Hispanic uh, area and not so much to the Asian area? They well, have higher morals? I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I can't claim that I'm not an expert on, on, uh, on Asian American families, but uh, I do know that when you have a close-knit family, uh, when parents uh, somewhat inculcate their kids with certain values, uh, provide them the stimulation and the challenge to learn and to, uh, to, to enrich themselves so that they can in turn enrich the communities that they live in. Um, I think that that makes a, a good formula. Unfortunately, because we're talking about very high poverty levels in Hispanic communities as in other minority communities, uh, oftentimes those things are not available. Well, Some, I understand that. And I understand that we had a guest tonight uh, who didn't have the guts to come on the show because her uh, deans told her that it was too rough a show and that my audience was a non-intellectual audience. She, obvi she, uh, she obviously is the one who's going to lose out on this because she's, she's never met a better audience than this. But I understand that the excuse, her excuse was going to be that these students, uh, I'm going to get to Sally in a second, all right? That these students uh, who are having a difficult time because they come from poverty, came from families that were broken when they came into the country, that were poverty stricken, etc. I, I challenge you to show me a more poverty-stricken group than the boat people who came yeah. from Vietnam. Yeah. And they're all speaking languages. They all own restaurants. They're yeah. all yeah. in business. They're yeah. all doing well. Let, let, let. And they've got a lower crime rate. Yeah. It, you know, if, if I may, you know, comment on, on, uh, on your statement. You know, as a Vietnam veteran, I was very happy that our country uh, opened up its doors in keeping with our traditions. Uh, you know, 750,000 Indo-Chinese came to the United States from Thailand, La Laos, Cambodia, and, and other countries. And I think that, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, we should be proud as a country for that. And maybe we can get into another discussion at some later point about that. But at any rate, uh, we know that out of 750,000 people that came into the United States during that period of time, uh, not all of them were young, bright kids. 
Uh, some of them are, are middle-aged people. Some are, are people that, that came here with, with few resources of any. Some came here with uh, low academic experience, if you will. That is that they weren't really integrated in an academic setting in their home country. And some came here as elderly uh, persons uh, who at some point, hopefully in the future, they'll become American citizens. But we have to understand that some of those folks will never be able to become proficient in the English language. What and happens? We have to understand that a higher percentage of them, a much higher percentage of them, mm -hmm. have become proficient in the English yes. language yes. than the people of the groups that you represent. And those individuals should be commended for it. I think that that's well, admirable. Well, that's exactly. I think we yeah. should commend them. Let me, let me talk to a lady by the name of Sally Peterson. She's teacher and president of Learning English Advocates Drive. It's a grassroots movement dedicated to the right of all children to learn the English language. Now, she led a teacher's referendum to overturn California's requirement that all teachers learn Spanish. Isn't that nice? She favors the immersion method for learning English, sink or swim, feels that bilingual programs isolate kids, make them feel different, cause slower and more difficult assimilation processes. Let me, let me ask Sally if she'd join us. Sally? Sally? Sally, can you hear me on the telephone? I sure can. How are you? Just fine. We've been talking to the experts, Sally. Now we have you on the phone, and uh, you've been in the trenches. How's it working in the classrooms, bilingual education in California? Well, I think I can speak uh, quite safely for thousands of teachers in the state of California and tell you flat out that bilingual education in this country is a national disaster. Yeah. And it's controlled by the opposition, and all they do to anyone who tries to speak out and say, you're racist, that controls this entire program, and it's growing like a giant spider web, and it's denying thousands of children the right to learn English. And those of us who speak out, that's the way they control it. And their lobby is very strong. They call you a racist, don't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's their only, that's all they can do. Because they can't attack me as a teacher. They try to say I have no skills anymore. But the opposition controls the program this way because most people are so fearful to speak out when someone calls you a racist. And you know, another thing that's so important to remember is that uh, uh, a racist by the name of Secretary of Education, William Bennett, termed bilingual education a total failure, and he's anything but a racist. He's a wonderful man, and he's right on target. You know, here we go with this bilingual education, immersion, whether we should teach them over a period of time, two, three, five, seven, eight years. In Boston, in Boston, 40% of the Hispanics have been taught with uh, the bilingual Spanish method, all right, for eight years. And of that 40% that were taught, 29.5% still dropped out of school the hell are we doing wrong? This method is not working, gentlemen. It's not working. We've got to come up with something where we unshackle our American citizens. And we've got them shackled. It's not fair to the Hispanics. It's not fair to the Asians. It's not fair to the Polish, the Jews, anyone who comes to this country. Now, Italians learn the language fast. <laughs> Sally, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, I know you had more to say. Let's hear from Sally a second. What's happening in this country is any federal money poured into bilingual mandates 96% of the programs to be transitional. And what the opposition does, because they have free access to, to newspaper coverage and we don't, they say how wonderful it is. All it does is teach children in their native language until they pass certain tests. Now, you know they're not going to pass those tests easily because they want to keep them in the program. For every child that's in the program, we're talking money. The more money, the larger this lobby gets, the larger this giant grows. Way of digging into the taxpayers' pockets Absolutely. again. I mean, hell, the finger is never out of the dike. They're trying to move it now to the junior and senior highs in California. It just does not work. And we, the teachers, are saying it. They're trying to replace all of the teachers and bring in bilingual teachers. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a good monolingual teacher who will teach English with love and caring. And these Latino people are denied their rights. And if these parents would only realize this, if we could get our message to all the people in this country, transitional bilingual would be done tomorrow because they'd say the teachers are speaking out. It doesn't work. You're hearing from the people who had vested interest in this program, not from the rank and file that I represent.
All right, let me hear from jo uh, from George. George, I haven't heard much from you tonight. Well, Sally is exactly right. You know, in the papers, just this weekend, the bilingual education program was being debated in New Jersey, and it costs uh, the the uh, different jurisdictions get a thousand dollars a head for the kids that are in the in the programs. A thousand bucks a head. Thousand dollars a head out of the New Jersey taxpayers' right. pocket. That's right. The state. How about pays the Elizabeth? It. Wasn't there wasn't there something they tried in Elizabeth? Uh, in Elizabeth, that was a different situation, uh, and I think there's a guest here that knows more about it than I do. But there was a situation there where the city, city employees refused to uh, speak English to the people who would come into the courthouses, who Jesus would come to the Mary city hall. Joseph, what the hell is happening in this country? We're going to be back in just a second. We'll examine just how well the bilingual experiment has worked around the world. Stand by. Are you tired of sitting home watching the same old boring television shows? Television is alive again at Channel 9, so be a part of our studio audience, if you dare. For tickets, call right now, 201-867-TIXX. If you've, just joined, if you've just joined us tonight, my friends, you've walked in on the middle of a discussion where there are a lot of people who think other languages should be taught in this country besides English. Now. We mentioned just a few minutes ago, just a few minutes ago, George mentioned that there was an expert in the audience who knew more about the Elizabeth, New Jersey situation. Assemblyman Walter Kern is with us. He's a New Jersey assemblyman. He's proposed legislation to make English the official language of New Jersey, legislation to repeal the bilingual education in New Jersey. And I think you can also cite the fact that uh, bilingual education has been a disaster in some other countries. Walter, take it. Take Thank it you very much. <laughs> it's good to be here again. What has happened in, in other countries, we can always profit by somebody else's mistake. In Belgium this past October, the government fell because they have a system of bilingualism. They have two Flemish. languages, French and Flemish. Yeah. And in, in one of the French... I thought one Flemish of, was something you got when you had a cold. <laughs> yes, now and then. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was, in the French area, there is a little town that predominantly speaks Flemish. They elected a mayor who refused to use the Flemish language. He spoke French. He spoke French and would only deal in French. That generated a national crisis and brought the whole government down. And they have right now in their constitution a mandate to use two languages. All right. Canada had a problem, too. What has happened in Canada is, with the two languages, that it has uh, fostered a separatist movement within uh, Quebec. Caused which economic very crisis. And in uh, the other provinces that were predominantly speaking English, they had to do all their, their laws all over again at great expense. But on the Elizabeth situation... Yeah, let me hear about Elizabeth, because that sounds like a real crap deal. <laughs> it certainly was. It certainly was. Uh, Elizabeth hires people through civil service and employed a lot of people from the uh, Hispanic community, and there's a large Hispanic community in Elizabeth. In Elizabeth. What happened was those em city employees refused to deal with the general public in English. As a result... No, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean they refused to deal? They I want a driver's speak. license. I go down so, and I can Somebody would come you. down and want a dog license or something or a marriage license. They wouldn't speak to them in English. Why? Because they, their native tongue was Spanish. The end result of that is the mayor had to come out with an order that they either were going to deal with the public in English or they were not going to stay on the, on the job. Good for the mayor. Good for the mayor. Well, they, they spoke English. They knew English, but they refused to use it. My bill would mandate that the official language of the state be English so we never see that kind of a problem. How many co-sponsors do you have? Half a dozen. Half a dozen is all? Yes. Why only half a dozen? Is everyone in your assembly chicken? Uh, well, sometimes uh, bills may have 60 sponsors no. and they don't move at all. Uh, I don't think the number of co-sponsors is, is, is material. I think it's the sentiment that's important and the vote. What committee does it have to go through? It's presently in state government and the chairman says he's going to give it a hearing uh, next month. All right. This gentleman wanted to say something. Pal, with your size, I'll let you say anything you want. Plain and simple, Mort. Our forefathers were forced to speak English in the American country. They had no argument about it. 
And if everybody speaks a different language now, we'll have that proverbial Tower of Babel. Nobody will know exactly what's going on at any one given time. Yeah, it's, it's frankly, it's one, of the, it's one of the problems that can cause this country economic chaos like we've never seen before. And if you want to look at countries where they have multiple languages and have problems, check Nigeria, all right? Check India. Check some of these countries where they can't get diddly squat moving for themselves. And we're heading in the same direction. Mr. Trevino, any thoughts? Well, you know, you know, they're, they're for... Do, do, uh, do, you, uh, do, do you get a t-shirt that says, you know, loudmouth after that? That's, are you done? Or, or German, too. Uh, Portuguese, too. Uh, the, uh, the amigo. The, uh, Por favor. Yes, thank you. Uh, the, um, no, I, I didn't mean any offense. Go ahead. I let let that, me hear what he has to say. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean any offense. I thought that maybe you get a T-shirt, you know, and if you hey, do, pal, I'd like to get one, if too. You meant offense, if you meant offense to a guy that size, you got something rolling around in your head that yeah. isn't brains. Yeah. Huh? And I, now, I, let I, me hear. Let I'm, me hear. I'm glad let we all went to the metal the track, detector. Let's hear it. Um, in, in terms of uh, in terms of, of other the experiences in other countries where which have been multilingual, I mean, for example, in uh, in in Belgium and in Canada, we're talking about deep-rooted, long-standing antagonism between people. In the United States, I can't see that Hispanic Americans have been after Italian Americans, or that Italians have been after Poles, or that the Irish. We are trying to avoid that. Kind of well, that Speak up to here, no. George. Look, get into this. Get going, you guys. Let me hear you guys go. Let me start debating what languages we're going to use. If we're no. going to start debating, I'm going to say I want Greek. Our, my native language, my family's language is Greek. And, and, if we're going to start debating that, all the different look, groups are going to go unites, after it. What unites us as Americans is English. Yeah. Is English. That's what unites us as Americans. Let, 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 me, let me suggest to you. Let me suggest to you that what unites us as Americans is patriotism. But we got to have a way to communicate that well, patriotism. We can't have to patriotism. We can't, we can't have patriotism. If I'm if I'm saying I pledge allegiance to the yeah. flag of the United States of America, and you're saying yo something or other, blah blah blah. Uh, that's, there's no patriotism there. Next, we're going to speak to a woman whose middle name is English. Join us. Terry English Robbins is with us uh, tonight on the phone, and uh, she's head of the Dade County Americans United to protect the English language. Now, she had her middle name changed legally to English. Terry, are you with us? Yeah, I sure am. How you doing, sweetheart? I'm going to have them turn up the monitor here so the studio audience can hear you. Yeah, because it's very safe. There you, there you go, sweetheart. Now we're safe. Are you in a safe place down there in Dade County where you're not going to get hurt for talking English? something you ought to be here in Dade County because Americans are almost being held hostage by a foreign language and a foreign culture that the uh, immigrant brought, brought with him from Cuba but I want to tell you something English plus has nothing to do with learning another language but the one thing I would like to get across to our Hispanics who come here to enjoy our freedoms and then work hard to end the traditional primacy of English in our country, I want to tell them that the United States is not a Monroe nation. We have a language, it's English, and we're damn proud of it. You're damn right we are. You're we are. Terry. Terry. 
Let me read this quote to Terry, and I want you to listen to this one. Terry, tell me if you've heard this. It came from the Dade County School Board Chairman. He says, while English is the language of the United States, Spanish is where it's at in Dade County. And if you want to be gainfully employed and live comfortably in Dade County, you damn well better learn to speak Spanish. Huh? You familiar with that quote, Terry? To mandate. Now listen to the word. They said we want to mandate English for every child in Dade County in our schools. Now, it, it isn't enough that we graduate kids from high school who don't speak English. They're not even speaking the language of the country that's educating him. Now they want to mandate it. So, so we call... Put another what? dime in, Terry. We told them, watch the school board has in store for American, American kids and It's a high-budget show. She pays for her own call. Terry, let me tell you something, all right? I, I think what's really pitiful, in most states, you know, in this country, it's possible to get a high school equivalency diploma without knowing English. That's right. And you, you know what else they do? Because I had questioned and I said, how is this possible? And they told me that we have no state or local laws to demand a proficiency in English in order to graduate. So I said, well, why don't we get them? We, they, so what they do is they give these tests, these kids tests in Spanish in order for them to graduate. It's got to stop. It really has to stop. What's amazing to me, what's really amazing to me, audience, and I think, and it's difficult to hear Terry tonight, but what's amazing to me is I don't know why the Asians in this country can assimilate so well, become such a part of our nation, learn the language, learn the economic system, learn to get off welfare, learn to succeed, learn to have families, learn to be Americans, and we can't do the same thing with people who should be Native Americans, our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Sir, what do you want to say? Well, Mort, uh, I'm no expert. Obviously, I'm a giant fan. Yeah! <laughs> but, but it appears to me here that people are just lazy. Now, here's a gentleman who came up in the 60s, speaks the language excellently. He's a perfect success story of exactly. the immersion method. Exactly. So perfect. With all these programs now, children are dropping out of school left and right. Oh, the government programs Here's for education in this no. country sucks. Of course. <laughs> Here's the silver platter. Come and take what you want. Here's the silver platter. Come and take what you want. If you don't like it, we'll give you something else. Well, they've been taking it, my friends. We're going to be back in just a minute. We're going to meet a young man who succeeded through all of this garbage. Yes. I want you to, first, the most complete success story, the most complete success story we've heard tonight is the man who proposes the bilingual education. He himself, through immersion, has come out on top. He's a model American citizen, speaks English beautifully, and has learned how to make the almighty buck. There's a young man. There's a young man down here. Uh, John, let me pronounce your name, Liao, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. John Liao came to this country as a youngster, am I correct? Yeah, oh, when right. I came around too. You uh, learned to speak English in the classroom, didn't you? Right. And uh, where, are you apply where are you in high school now? Yeah, I'm where a you senior at uh, Bronx High School of Science. You're a senior yeah. in Bronx High School. Have you applied to any universities? Yeah, I'm applying right now. We're in the process. Which universities? Here. Well, my dream is Harvard. And, Dream uh, is Harvard? Yeah. It'll take away all your education. Why don't you go to Princeton? I like Princeton, too. Go to Princeton, all right? Or NYU. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. If people want to live in this great country and enjoy the benefits of this country, the least they could do is learn the language. We're wasting far too much money on this. It's a waste of taxpayers' money. My hard-earned money is going to balance with 25 different languages on there. 126. A, 126, whatever. Yeah. More money. It's a waste. Yeah. It is Learn a language if you want to live in this country. You, sir. Country. You, sir. 
Yeah, um, I think it's a disgrace that I have to take the subway every morning and I gotta see an ad for bla Black Flag that says, No Mas Cucarachas. <laughs> where we end the show, right there. I think that's where we end it. No mas cucarachas, all right? As Americans, we open our doors to all people, from Hispanics to blacks to Vietnamese to all other ethnic groups who will contribute to our future. Damn those who would divide us by suggesting that you are less capable than our forefathers and incapable of melding with us all into this great nation. America first!